AAA section. There we go. As I, as I said before, I'm uh, the chair of the AIAA section here in Houston. Um, I've met uh, probably many of y'all at various points in time, either through our own programming or through various programming throughout the JSC community and the wider aerospace community. Um, and we're really excited to start, uh, start up our series of technical seminars once more to supplement a lot of the networking events that we've had over the past few months. Um, this is the first uh, technical seminar we've had for 2024, um, and I'm very excited for the topic because uh, it's very, uh, very relevant to uh, where the aerospace community is heading. Um, and so I'll go ahead and give the proverbial mic to Douglas Yazel here in a second, but I did just want to briefly mention um, that uh, uh, hopefully you all have, have gotten engaged with, with the AIAA community here. Um, if not, you know, we'd love to, to hear from folks about uh, ways that the section can, can contribute to the really the technical and the social health of the various aerospace groups, you know, scattered across Houston. Um, and so just drop me a chat, a chat link or a Teams message or an email. Um, or really anybody here that has an AIAA t-shirt. And uh, we'll go ahead and get you connected and um, hopefully hopefully start start seeing folks around at, at more events like this. Uh, but go ahead, uh, Mr. Yaz, we'll take the, take the mic. Thank you. Welcome to the Lunch and Learn from the History Technical Committee of the Houston section of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, AIAA. I'm your host, Douglas Yazel. I'm the chair of that history technical committee. Other Houston section AIAA members are always welcome to join me in that volunteer work. Dave Hansen is our co-host today. He's a retired NASA civil servant. He's also president of two electric vehicle EV clubs in the Houston area. One of those two clubs is the Johnson Space Center EV Enthusiast Club, JEVEC. Speaking of AIAA and related history, The Space Race is a new two-hour documentary TV show which first appeared this month on the National Geographic Channel, Hulu, and Disney+. Plus. This new TV show presents stories of Black American astronauts serving in space. The timing of this TV show premiere fits well with Black History Month, February 2024. Today's Lunch and Learn uses the title, The Tale of Two Translunar Aborts. Our presenter, Daniel R. Adamo, is an AIAA distinguished speaker and is now living in Oregon after leaving Houston in 2008. Mr. Adamo is an astrodynamics consultant focused on space mission trajectory design, operations, and architecture. He works with clients primarily at NASA and in academia. Until retirement in 2008, Mr. Adamo was employed by United Space Alliance as a trajectory expert, serving as a front room flight controller for 60 space shuttle missions. Along with console duties during simulations and missions, this job entailed development of trajectory designs, software tools, flight rules, console procedures, and operations concepts. Please welcome our speaker, Daniel R. Adamo. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to the uh, Houston section for inviting me uh, uh, to uh, participate in this lunch and learn. I, I've done some in-person lunch and learns before I moved from uh, from Houston, but it's great to be able to come back virtually and uh, interact with uh, uh, folks, um, uh, some of whom I've worked with. Um, and uh, I'll uh, be sharing my screen here and here's my charts. Very good. Okay, you should see that. Um, and uh, I know we, we have about 50 people in the audience, Douglas uh, and Dave. Uh, you may want to uh, uh, let people uh, enable themselves on audio or handle questions in the chat but I do want to take questions as I proceed through the slides instead of having folks uh, 
uh, wait till the end and perhaps forget something or wind up in a crunch. Uh, and to that end, um, Dave has been kind enough uh, to uh, extend uh, the Zoom session so that it's uh, uh, gonna uh, end at 1.30 um, uh, Central Time. So uh, we have plenty of time for interaction. Uh, we don't need to, to go to 1.30, but I am certainly willing to um, and uh, we'll value any uh, uh, interaction uh, from from the audience. Um, so as you say, Dan, uh, folks, feel free to put questions in the chat and I'll monitor that. And we're up to about 79 participants right now. Oh, wow. Well, thank you very much, Dave, because uh, I go into full screen mode like this so you can see this, the charts uh, better. Uh, I can't see chat. So it's not that I'm ignoring you. Uh, we're just uh, having to work um, uh, a coordination of your, of your questions. Uh, so as Douglas said, uh, this uh, pitch is uh, an inaugural uh, presentation of a tale of two translunar aborts. Um, and uh, the natural uh, question is which aborts? So uh, uh, we're gonna talk uh, first a rather near-term history um, the uh, January uh, uh, flight of the Peregrine, which was the first uh, CLIPS mission um, landing attempt. And uh, it, it did get aborted. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the mainly policy uh, implications of, uh, of that mission, at least from my point of view, trajectory is, is everything. I can't um, really write a meaningful paper with the skill set and tools I have without uh, uh, a good trajectory. Um, and uh, Peregrine is not by any means the only um, mission not to, sh to share its trajectory very well. And that can even include, in my humble opinion, NASA with uh, Artemis One. Um, they got themselves into a legal posture with contractors for SLS that wouldn't let them publicly post their trajectory until uh, after the spacecraft Orion had separated from the upper stage, the I, uh, interim cryo stage. Um, so uh, that, uh, that forced me into some, uh, as some of you folks uh, who subscribe to my uh, papers uh, can recall, that forced me into some um, uh, sort of uh, meatball uh, trajectory design to try and fill in the gaps. And I wanna avoid doing that. I like, I like trajectories that if not in real time, that certainly shortly after the mission evolve into an as flown trajectory from liftoff to splashdown or whatever the mission mode is, uh, womb to tomb. Um, so the second uh, abort we're gonna discuss is Apollo 13s. And that is rather historic uh, in aerospace uh, uh, terms back in April 1970, uh, which was the third lunar landing attempt. And most of you are familiar with Apollo 13 from a, a rather accurate um, uh, movie by that title. Um, so uh, uh, as I mentioned, the um, uh, material for this uh, presentation uh, is uh, actually uh, uh, available uh, courtesy of the Houston section uh, if you go to this um, URL, uh, you'll see a list of, I believe, 147 of these uh, papers that I've released uh, for public consumption. Uh, there's no intellectual property here at all. At least I'm not aware of any because uh, I'm principal author on uh, all these papers. Um, and uh, so ATIG 147 is what to look for if you're interested in the details on Peregrine and ATIG 144. Um, is uh, uh, focused on Apollo 13. And these are uh, published uh, in the last uh, six months. Um, so uh, the two missions have uh, shared abort scenarios. Both of them suffered acute capability loss uh, from overpressurized onboard storage tanks. Um, the Peregrine uh, official mishap investigation results are still pending. I checked yesterday. There's nothing I can find on the web yet. Um, and uh, those, uh, the, the Peregrine uh, overpressurization was just a leak. The Apollo 13 overpressurization resulted in an explosion, um, but then there was uh, residual 
uh, leakage overboard so that uh, that situation in terms of uh, perturbations on the trajectory uh, uh, for Apollo 13 uh, was um, had a lot of similarities with uh, the uh, persistent leaking that uh, Peregrine suffered. Um, both aborts were declared en route to the moon after translunar injection. So these were, if not in deep space, certainly heading into deep space. Uh, in Peregrine's uh, uh, case, uh, you, you were still very close to the Earth, but rapidly uh, receding from the Earth after translunar injection. Neither spacecraft had stable attitude control post-abort, um, nor were the uh, trajectory adjustments that were applied to both missions very precise, because uh, without precise attitude control, uh, you're sort of uh, like uh, uh, letting a, a balloon loose with the uh, 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 acting as a <laughs> as a air escaping, acting as propellant. Um, there was uh, persistent overboard venting from both spacecraft, as I already mentioned, and that's just a navigation nightmare, um, particularly since um, with the um, attitude control, uh, any kind of vent that's continuous is going to uh, really uh, be kind of random in its direction um, to some degree. Uh, and we'll see uh, in the Apollo uh, 13 um, uh, part of the presentation, which is more, uh, more technical, more, more dynamics related, uh, we'll see how that actually has uh, an interesting signature that tells us a little more about the nature of the venting going on after the uh, abort. Any questions so far? Well, I'll go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so here is a plot uh, that I made after I realized, oh, the uh, Peregrine folks are actually, uh, um, actually going to share their trajectory. And, and I was very ignorant at the time as I realized this. And they do it through, um, um, or it was done, I won't say they did it uh, with any cognizance, um, it was done um, uh, through this uh, server JPL operates called Horizons. And I'm sure many of you uh, with uh, interest in trajectories and, and analyzing trajectories and planning trajectories um, are familiar with JPL Horizons. Um, they um, uh, post uh, ephemerides for virtually every small object in the solar system we know about. Uh, and then they also post trajectories for missions. Um, and uh, so what I, I saw as I uh, 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 discovered uh, Peregrine data out there on Horizons is uh, January 11th's posting, uh, which would place um, Peregrine out here along this arc somewhere in, in January 11th. And let me just explain what we're looking at here. This is inertial motion uh, projected into the plane of the ecliptic, which is uh, within five degrees of the moon's orbit. So here's the Earth sitting here, and the shaded area is Earth's night side. So the sun's off to the uh, right, about maybe the 2.30 o'clock position. Um, and, uh, and we see this trajectory from horizons in blue. Um, and it ended just before the 18th of uh, January. And I picked the last state vector oh in God. that and oh uh, proceeded to uh, extrapolate that uh, off into the future. And sure enough, you encounter the moon. Uh, the first apogee, uh, the moon isn't anywhere near this part of its orbit. But on the second apogee, uh, after you fly by the Earth, um, you, uh, you encounter the moon. And indeed, you impact the moon um, uh, at hypervelocity in this case, because um, at that point, I knew the mission was aborted. So I didn't apply any trajectory corrections. It just kept coasting uh, and uh, hit the moon uh, in the, uh, if you were looking at the moon uh, around, uh, uh, you know, in the southern sky, so it's highest as it gets in the northern hemisphere. If you're looking at the moon, the impact occurred at around the 10 o'clock position on the uh, near the moon's limb, but on the near side and actually in darkness. So I was getting kind of excited that, hey, maybe we can observe the impact. 
um, at least get some kind of that lunar centered science out of it. Um, but it, I, I personally don't like disposals uh, at hypervelocity on the moon's surface, whether they're, you know, defunct rocket stages or a, a descent stage um, uh, that gets crashed into the moon as part of uh, a lunar landing. Um, we're going to wind up with a badly littered moon as well as infrastructure threats uh, if we continue uh, with that kind of, of uh, a policy. Um, but the thing about this trajectory plot that uh, kind of disturbed me is, is um, there's this discontinuity um, evident um, just before the uh, January 9th time tick. And uh, what I'm talking about is this little blip here. And depending on what kind of monitor you have, that may be uh, a leap to actually see it. So I'm going to uh, zoom in here. Um, and perhaps now it's a little more apparent. There's a little jump here. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't know it at the time, but I sort of got, it sort of dawned on me uh, over subsequent days operating with these data sets on Horizon um, that they probably arise from spacecraft operators issuing only predicted data and then horizons just cobbling the predicted data arcs together um, without any coordination. And that, that kind of dawned on me in uh, talking with uh, the horizons webmaster. And um, then uh, after the mission was over, I got in touch with some folks who were doing some of this navigation. And it was kind of apparent uh, from those interactions that there was no, um, coordination between the spacecraft operators and navigators uh, and horizons. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little more about the policy implications I feel should be um, arising from that. And hopefully they are. Um, so uh, any questions at this point? Okay. So here's the end state of the ephemeris on horizons. Um, and uh, you can see with a li little tiny orange arc here, I didn't have much to extrapolate by then. Uh, at the end of the orange arc right down here near Earth, I, I hit the atmosphere and incinerated just like the real world spacecraft did. Um, but uh, you can see that uh, this jump here persisted just prior to the ninth. And then there's an even worse jump out here around the 12th. Um, there's another one uh, I can see at this scale anyway here and still another one here. And I think if I look carefully around this time tick, there's one here on the 18th. Um, so there, there's just, you know, the, the trajectory is just riddled with these discontinuities caused by somebody supplying data to somebody that wasn't allowed to interact with them and was just cobbling stuff together at his management's request. Um, and uh, we wound up with this, whereas in most spacecraft uh, archived uh, trajectories on horizons, uh, the final ephemeris um, uh, is uh, supposed to be a, a conglomeration of best estimate and as flown uh, trajectories. Uh, in other words, it, it's really close to what you, um, you actually flew in the real world and uh, can be used for all kinds of nice reconstruction work, uh, which I, uh, uh, I will admit I am uh, a, a stakeholder in uh, very unofficially. Um, so this blue ephemeris that you see here is what's on horizon uh, to this very day, or at least I checked yesterday and it hadn't changed. Um, so uh, any questions at this point? Then uh, let's look a little more at what uh, what's going on here in the uh, disposal uh, strategy, because as we saw in that first plot, um, the thing was headed to the moon, but it didn't wind up there. Thank goodness. Um, this is my best reconstruction of the as-flown ground track um, coming uh, back to Earth, Peregrine's final plunge. 
um, this was um, uh, a snapshot uh, of my ground track display at uh, only uh, 2,865 kilometers altitude. Um, and uh, at that point, uh, Peregrine was located where the Maltese Cross is. Uh, the circumscribing yellow uh, is uh, the horizon uh, at that point. So still uh, a good portion of the earth was visible. Um, and uh, the uh, ground track begins over here, just west of the Hawaiian Islands, about 12 hours before entry, and then proceeds uh, through this uh, turn back uh, to this point. And this is the entry point, uh, and any debris footprint would have been scattered uh, off in this direction in a very remote area of the Southwest Pacific. Uh, so uh, it end up, ended up being a very responsible disposal uh, given the abort scenario involved. Uh, any questions on that? Okay. Um, I, here's... I do see one in the chat. Oh, okay. yeah, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, go, move there. I'll, I'll go back. Yeah, the question is, were there any mid-course corrections on this trajectory? More than I could possibly count or, or have insight to. Yes, there were. Uh, the As you can probably ascertain from reading the paper on Peregrine uh, that I published, um, they had a, um, because it was an oxidizer leak, um, at least that's the propellant they were losing. I, I, I don't have official uh, uh, investigation reports yet, but because it was an oxidizer only leak, um, they had all their fuel on board so they could burn propellant with maybe even a little bit of oxidizer in there, but it was gonna be really fuel rich. Um, that allowed them to do fuel only attitude control and they managed to keep the spacecraft stable enough so that they could uh, keep their batteries charged, keep the power flowing from their solar arrays. Um, but uh, doing uh, uh, course corrections uh, was very problematic because the the any kind of uh, long burn would have probably caused an engine failure, possibly a catastrophic explosion um, because it was so fuel rich. And so uh, they had to keep the burn durations uh, pretty low, uh, probably on the order of 10 seconds, maybe a minute, uh, but I doubt it uh, at any one time and then let the engine cool down and then uh, light up again later. Um, so yes, they did course corrections. Um, I could probably do some more research in the uh, Horizons Ephemeris and maybe find out where those corrections were applied because the jumps you see uh, are not course for corrections. Those are actual discontinuities uh, on, you know, from one trajectory to another that was subsequently generated, but not a, a smooth kind of um, transition that you'd see after a real course correction. So. I would need an as flown ephemeris to, to start pulling those out. But I understand from uh, the folks that were working Peregrine Navigation that they will be publishing papers or uh, assuming their management lets them, um, they will be publishing papers. So we'll probably get a really good story as to how many of these things did they do uh, in the coming month, months, maybe by the end of the year. And Dan, we do have a question. It looks like there is landmass under the entry point. <laughs> Could they have placed the destruction zone further out into the ocean? And, and that's going to be the story on the next chart. Uh, remember, this is just the uh, snapshot current position at altitude 2,865 kilometers. The entry interface point is here, and that's at uh, uh, about 121 kilometers. Um, so uh, that's going to scatter debris off in this direction. Um, the debris footprint would be out here, probably beyond the horizon circle uh, for most of it, assuming anything made it to the surface or down to stratospheric altitudes. Um, so uh, let's go to that. Unless there's another question, let's go to that next chart and look at the heroics. Uh, because, yeah, this, this, this trajectory is pretty safe, but here's where they started out as best I can reckon. Uh, and again, I'm going to uh, zoom in. Uh, a little bit uh, to give you uh, a little better idea of what I'm pointing at. So uh, here's the extrapolation on January 13th. Um, 
this is where the entry interface altitude was on, on that day's ephemeris. Um, and uh, this uh, gamma symbol is the uh, flight path angle at that entry interface point. Uh, so that's the angle at which uh, you're descending into the Earth's atmosphere. And it's, it's 18.5 degrees, if you can't read it there, it's kind of low contrast. Um, 18.5 degrees. Um, and uh, that's uh, not a really comfortable place. I mean, you could be doing real damage to the Great Barrier Reef, if not even some of the coastal towns if, uh, or, or shipping, you know, tourism, whatever uh, that, that was going on uh, off the coast of Australia. So that's not a really good place to do it, um, to do the disposal. Um, and two days later on January 15th, I found uh, this to be the entry interface point here, uh, right, in, uh, uh, right in close to um, uh, New Guinea uh, and uh, uh, north of Australia, could have scattered debris ac across the uh, northern part of Australia. Um, very, very inadvisable. The uh, flight path angle steepened to minus 30 degrees uh, at this point. Um, and then the next day, uh, the entry point moved slightly uh, to the uh, east northeast, and and this looks even worse over uh, Papua New, Gu New Guinea and scattering debris uh, all over this part of uh, uh, the uh, the ocean. Uh, not pretty. Um, and uh, I was really relieved on the seventeenth to see uh, this be the entry point. Uh, the flight path angle shallowed a little bit. It's minus 19 degrees. But as you'll see with the Apollo part of this section, uh, that's really steep. I mean, uh, something like an Apollo capsule or Orion would have a real hard time uh, staying together uh, coming in that steeply. They like something more like, you know, five degrees, six degrees maybe. Um, and uh, and so this, this was quite... Uh, uh, steep enough to incinerate uh, a spacecraft like that. Um, the final uh, uh, extrapolation I did on the 18th, which was the previous plot, um, uh, showed it right uh, right here. Um, uh, well, uh, uh, you know, the debris scattering to the southeast uh, uh, would have been well clear of any land masses and probably over um, parts of the Pacific that aren't traversed by a lot of ships. But even coming in at, at only uh, minus 15, minus 16 degrees, um, uh, that would have been so steep that uh, a spacecraft like uh, Peregrine would have broken up and incinerated pretty thoroughly. Um, any questions on this? Hopefully that answered the previous question. So hope, fortunately, they were able to um, uh, do enough trajectory control that they got what I'd call a uh, responsible uh, disposal. So the next page is where uh, we may have a lot of questions. Uh, uh, this is a lot of words, but um, uh, my, uh, my big takeaway from the Peregrine scenario is that timely trajectory data must be made public. There's so many stakeholders in safe space travel that you might as well upfront before you even launch, uh, come up with a plan to share your data publicly. Um, and uh, the reason I say that, if for no other, uh, with a US mission, is that uh, if you conduct your mission under US auspices, and that includes uh, if the US uh, launches you from, uh, or if somebody launches you from US territory, or if the US uh, uh, has uh, an interest in your spacecraft uh, that would come from, for example, NASA putting payloads on your spacecraft. Um, if uh, the uh, taxpayers are funding your spacecraft to any uh, appreciable degree, then um, you, uh, the US incurs a liability as an out outer space treaty signatory, uh, such that uh, uh, they are accountable, the US is accountable for any damage done uh, to any other uh, party uh, that is signatory to this treaty. Um, and uh, any of their citizens, I guess, juridic, juridic, 
juridical, juridical persons, um, uh, any of its citizens, uh, businesses, whatever, um, and uh, any um, of their um, uh, objects in airspace or outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies. So that pretty much covers uh, even today, this thing was enacted in 1966, I believe, even today, that pretty much covers uh, anywhere where we're uh, conducting business out in space. Um, the U.S. Uh, in this case was liable uh, to damage done to practically any country in the world. Um, if there's a, a question um, uh, as to who is signatory, I have a map I can show, uh, but I won't call it up. It's pretty much everybody but a few countries that are in Africa and some uh, islands out in the Pacific. <laughs> it's pretty much it. Um, so, uh, uh, you're, you're, the U.S. is liable for a mission like this. Um, and, you know, I, I recognize uh, private industry, uh, commercial companies, if you want to call them like NASA, but they, uh, some of them aren't really commercial yet. Um, I recognize they have uh, intellectual property and they need to protect it. Um, and that pretty much in any process I'm aware of as, as a trajectory a practitioner for decades, um, that pretty much is confined to how you design the trajectory. Okay, so how it's designed or determined, that can be proprietary. Maybe you've got some kind of highfalutin sensor network that lets you do orbit determination uh, really accurately and really quickly. That's fine, keep that proprietary. But the trajectory itself is not proprietary. Um, I've seen people try and patent trajectories. And it's like, well, you can patent how you got it, but the trajectory is based on physics that's been around for hundreds of years. Um, it's not patentable. Um, so it's not intellectual property, the trajectory itself. Um, and uh, I am maintaining that trajectory data must be diligently posted for public access in a timely manner on platforms like Horizons, doesn't have to be Horizons, to facilitate coordination with planetary defense because we've got networks worldwide right now with telescopes and other sensors, radar too, um, that are constantly on the lookout for uh, an impacting asteroid or comet uh, headed our way. Uh, and when you keep your trajectory proprietary, um, you, um, uh, in effect, fool those sensors into thinking we got incoming if you're trying to dispose of a vehicle like Peregrine. Uh, so it's really essential that you share that with uh, the planetary defense community. Um, the military might be nice too, so we don't think World War III is starting. Um, a uh, uh, aviation interest so that air traffic can be rooted away from an area. Um, the maritime interests are certainly uh, uh, need to be uh, informed and kept situationally aware. Um, and then spacecraft operations organizations worldwide to prevent uh, an in inadvertent collision. And someday uh, we may have infrastructure on the moon uh, and elsewhere in the solar system that uh, should be kept apprised of where you are and where you're going. Uh, it just seems like you know, space responsibility 101. Um, you know, another good example of good uh, citizenship out there is arguably one of the biggest polluters of low earth orbit does one of the best jobs sharing trajectory data. They got 4,600 Starlink satellites, space, SpaceX does, uh, orbiting in, in low earth orbit and um, three times daily, they publish precision ephemerides for public access uh, on spacetrack.org. And I was just there Friday uh, polling uh, the latest batch of Starlinks that had been launched the uh, previous day from Vandenberg. Um, and um, uh, it turned out that swarm of satellites, just not even a day after uh, it had been launched, was going to fly over my house. So I was uh, able to... Uh, uh, do what I call a sky track plot, 
which shows just exactly how it's going to move through the stars going over us. I think it was like 78 degrees elevation. Uh, and it was spot on. Um, based on these ephemerities, they post three times daily uh, on all the Starlink satellites. Uh, and these satellites, particularly the freshly launched ones, they're maneuvering even. And they're able to keep track of what that maneuver plan is and still give you a very precise uh, idea of where they are. And the reason for that is, you know, those maneuvers totally affect how collision avoidance is going to play out for the next couple of days. And so they, they keep these updating three times daily um, as the maneuvers play out uh, and as the constellation evolves. Um, and, you know, the analogy with earthly air transport is blatantly obvious to me um, that uh, any kind of uh, route or flight planning, uh, if you kept that proprietary, air traffic control would be ineffective and incur frequent loss of life and property. It would be uh, truly chaotic in our airspace, both domestic and international. So uh, there's, there's my soapbox spiel for this entire presentation. Uh, any other questions before we move on to Apollo 13? Okay, well, as I said, Apollo 13 is largely uh, uh, a uh, uh, little lesson in physics for us about uh, um, translunar aborts, uh, because here we, here we have uh, not a Horizons ephemeris. Unfortunately, uh, Horizons didn't exist back then, and, and NASA uh, was not able to uh, supply a really nice, dense, uh, temporarily dense, uh, as flown ephemeris to uh, uh, a facility like Horizons. The internet didn't exist. Any of that stuff was yet to be invented and deployed. Um, and so all we have to go on are these temporarily sparse um, NASA uh, uh, Apollo data sets. Uh, they're called NATS, NASA Apollo trajectory elements. Um, and uh, they only occur at, um, uh, the, uh, they only survive, I should say. They used to be temporally dense, but um, all the records of, of the temporally dense data on magnetic tapes or on paper in people's garages uh, have long since disappeared. Um, and so um, what we're left with uh, are these Apollo post-flight reports that publish these nice, you know, six elements with the time tag um, at uh, events like major maneuvers, or you might get it, you know, at spacecraft separation and that kind of thing. Um, it's not a lot to go on, but it's enough to provide some really good information. So here again, we have an inertial um, uh, geocentric plot of the Apollo 13 as flown trajectory. And the green segment is uh, prior to the abort. And then you can see out here, 83% of the way to the moon, the spacecraft suffered a uh, almost catastrophic explosion that certainly aborted the lunar landing, uh, but then resulted in doing a lunar flyby and gravity assist back toward the earth. Uh, and, uh, and so this red segment is the post-abort uh, trajectory. Um, and, uh, and it looks really cool here, but I'm going to show you um, that uh, uh, the uh, safe crew return enta entailed three pretty big trajectory-related tasks. Um, let me just add one other feature about this, um, about this plot that you didn't see in the peregrine plots because they were just projections of the ecliptic plane. You're looking straight down onto it. Here, uh, we've uh, rotated off 30 degrees from straight down on the ecliptic. So you can see um, the third dimension with these projection lines onto the ecliptic plane, these little dotted lines. Um, and you can see how, yeah, the moon's orbit, this is about a five degree inclination to the ecliptic. And um, uh, the Apollo 13 orbit had a pretty similar inclination to the ecliptic, not, not a high inclination by any means at any point uh, in the mission. Um, and and at, uh, at the end here, um, uh, along the uh, uh, terminal trajectory to Earth, 
uh, it's almost exactly in the ecliptic plane. Uh, these last two time ticks don't have um, uh, much of any uh, distance from the ecliptic. Um, here again, the shaded area is Earth's night side. So the sun's off in this direction, which sort of makes sense because this two Aries uh, arrow points at where the sun would be at the spring equinox, March 21st or so. Um, and so this mission was flown in April. So the sun had moved off in this direction. So the sun is shining uh, from the lower right to the upper left. And that's an important uh, uh, point to remember as we go through the rest of these ch uh, ch charts here. Uh, any questions on this? So this is our as-flown baseline. Um, let's just look at where the crew was headed at the time of the explosion because they had actually gotten off of this free return trajectory that comes neatly back to the earth. And they were on this trajectory. So here we are at the explosion, fly by the moon, uh, rather low altitude because they needed that altitude to um, prepare for lunar landing. Uh, so they did a very close fly by the moon. Uh, peri periapsis was probably close to 100 kilometers um, and uh, got this very tight hairpin turn, too tight for a free return to the earth. And so you fly by the earth uh, 18,759 kilometers as best I can reconstruct and extrapolate uh, from the Earth's uh, surface. Um, so uh, not, not a good plan. And so that's the first thing they did was uh, along this arc uh, headed toward the moon, they performed a correction, <clears throat> a uh, mid-course correction that uh, at least got them headed back to the earth um, and uh, a lot closer. Um, and uh, here's, here's where they would have wound up after that first correction uh, burn. Uh, it's called the MC2 burn. Um, the, approaching the earth here, um, I've got uh, again, the Maltese cross snapshot at 1900 kilometers altitude. You then, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way. You approach Earth along this arc um, and then uh, uh, 1900 kilometers of where the snapshot is. Here's where entry interface would have occurred over South Africa. And that would have caused splashdown here in the Western Indian Ocean. Problem is um, most of the recovery forces, really all the recovery forces of any uh, significance had been pre-deployed uh, before launch to the vicinity of Hawaii. So uh, that's what this uh, second task entailed was uh, relocating near Hawaii where we had lots of recovery uh, uh, resources. Uh, and then also shortening the return uh, to build uh, consumables margin, uh, which was very tight uh, on the uh, timeline leading to this entry in, in the Indian Ocean. Any questions on, on this so far? So task two was uh, pretty, uh, pretty important as well. And in fact, it, it was uh, this TEI burn, trans-earth injection burn, was uh, much larger than the MC2 burn. Um, uh, this entailed uh, uh, lighting up uh, and firing the uh, uh, lunar module de descent propulsion system docked to the uh, command service modules um, in this lifeboat mode of, of um, operation they were in because power to the command module was totally gone. Propulsion from the service module, which you normally would have used to, uh, 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 to uh, perform a, a docked burn with the lunar module, uh, that was gone as well. So you're left with the lunar module descent propulsion uh, stage, which you know was designed to, to fly uh, down to the moon uh, but undocked from the command service module. So you had some kind of inherent control problems to begin with, and those were only uh, complicated by the fact that uh, uh, the command service module was basically disabled and inert. Okay, um, so that's what the second task did. Um, and uh, here I've got the uh, uh, post-abort trajectory plotted out. Um, uh, so that you can see exactly where these maneuvers occurred. 
there, there was the TEI burn we've already mentioned, um, and that occurred two hours after closest approach to the moon. Uh, so you'd already done the hairpin turn around the moon and were at least headed back to the earth. And then TEI basically just uh, drove you toward the earth to increase that radial uh, component of velocity um, so that you shortened the trajectory. Um, and these time ticks are at uh, six hour intervals. Um, mid course correction three and mid course correction four are down here. And then finally this little uh, green arc here was after um, they uh, separated from uh, the service module. Um, and of course the service module was sort of their albatross because um, it uh, was constantly uh, or uh, venting, I'll say, over a prolonged arc on and off. Nobody's quite sure because we didn't have any accelerometers to tell us um, just what um, what those venting impulses were like, whether they were uh, compounded by other events that were propulsive, like a uh, superfluid helium disk on the lunar module was designed to burst because it couldn't maintain um, uh, the cryostate of the superfluid helium uh, for very long. And they knew pressure was going to build up. And normally that would have happened after lunar landing. Uh, but in this case, it happened somewhere on this trans-Earth arc uh, and uh, probably imparted an impulse, but people weren't sure if that had an effect on this persistent problem they were having. Uh, I mean, it's one thing to get back to the Earth, but as um, I was alluding to in the Peregrine plots, uh, it's also really important to get the right flight path angle at entry interface. And in the Apollo program, you needed to be no steeper than 7.4, minus 7.4 degrees, and no shallower than minus 5.25. If you got steeper than 7.4, minus 7.4, you ran the risk of um, um, uh, entry aerodynamic loads being so uh, great, along with the thermal loads, that you would either break up or burn up um, during the entry. And then on the other side, if you were shallower than five and a quarter degrees negative, well, then you could uh, wind up uh, getting into the atmosphere and skipping back out again, if you got into the atmosphere at all. And that's see post TEI, um, because the burn was such a long uh, and uh, uh, intensive exercise of the descent propulsion system in a very non-standard control mode, um, we wound up um, uh, with a perigee uh, height of, 100, uh, of 133 kilometers and entry interface is defined as uh, 121, 122. So um, you basically were way too shallow, uh, too shallow to even compute the entry interface flight path angle because you didn't get the entry interface. So the, although not as great in magnitude as the original problem where you were more than a thousand miles above entry interface. Here you were a few miles above and this would not have resulted in a survivable entry uh, in all cases, uh, in, in all probability. Um, uh, so yeah, the, the burn lasted 263 seconds. So that's almost three minutes. Uh, I'm sorry, almost, it's over four minutes, um, almost five minutes. Um, and uh, had a, a change of velocity of, 262 meters per second. So it was a huge burn. And so it's not surprising you didn't get precise control. Um, but the interesting thing is that um, you wound up um, with a perigee height of 133 kilometers. Um, as you went past TEI, that kept increasing. It got up, uh, uh, basically was increasing at a, average rate of a kilometer per hour. Um, so there was something going on that wasn't being accounted for in the coasted trajectory mission control was, was running, uh, which included you know, sun, earth, moon, gravity pretty much. And then there was really no other body force supposed to be acting on this, on this vehicle. It should have been, if anything, really quiet because they had all the systems powered down to conserve uh, electricity. Uh, so um, 
it, it was uh, a very disconcerting uh, uh, scenario. Um, so they went and uh, saw this increase and knew they had to lower perigee anyway, uh, just needed to lower it a lot more with MCC3. So at MC3, MCC3, they uh, uh, brought the uh, uh, post-burn uh, flight path angle down to minus 6.2 degrees. So they were in the range, um, but by the time they got to this MCC4 point, it had shallowed out some more. Uh, before MCC4. So post MCC4, they uh, steepened it again. And the as flown uh, entry flight path angle actually was steeper than when they uh, performed MCC4. And my hypothesis is because they got rid of the source of the venting when they shortly after MCC4 jettisoned the service module. And then all I had to do was worry about jettisoning the lunar module, which they did, you know, just before entry down here, or the plot be after the plot ends, um, and uh, and got this uh, reasonably good uh, entry flight path angle, uh, a little on the uh, steep side, if anything. Um, so um, uh, when I went and started really um, uh, pulling apart these uh, NASA Apollo trajectory elements. Uh, to see what could be ferreted out of uh, all this activity along this, this arc uh, heading for Earth after, after TEI. Um, I found that the delta V vector, um, all they publish in these post-flight reports is the, um, is the uh, magnitude of the delta V, but the, the change in velocity vector uh, at MCC3 points within 18 degrees of the sun and similarly, on uh, MCC4, that was a slightly smaller burn, the direction points within 14 degrees of the sun. So to me, the, the big hypothesis, the big takeaway from all this analysis that, is that because the flyby of the moon occurred near first quarter, as almost all the Apollo uh, moon flybys did, because the landing sites had to have um, landing occurring shortly after sunrise. And so the moon was always near first quarter uh, on these missions because the landing sites were on the near side of the moon, near the center of the disk as you see it uh, from Earth. Some of them got a little spread out either way uh, toward the end of the program, but they were all on the near side of the, of the, of the moon. And uh, that caused um, us to fly these missions near first quarter phase. And uh, first quarter phase means um, if you're the moon out here, then the sun is shining from um, behind where the moon has been. Uh, and so the sun is shining as evidenced by the shading here and by the uh, Aries location. The sun is shining broadside to the return trajectory. And what's that doing? Well, if you've got a leaky spacecraft, the side pointed toward the sun is where the leaks are gonna be more pronounced and uh, because of solar heating. And because of that, your trajectory is getting pushed away from the earth um, in, in terms of this broadside venting that's going on, thrusting you toward the upper left. And so quite naturally, uh, if you're gonna compensate for that, you must thrust in your corrections to the lower right, pretty much at the sun. And that is, my best explanation as a, a dynamics uh, kind of person uh, as to why these flight path angles kept shallowing uh, during uh, Apollo 13's uh, trans-Earth trajectory. Any questions? No questions in the chat, but um, everybody, please uh, save your chat if you're interested in information about today's event in our section. There is a question that just popped up. What consideration, if any, on Apollo 13 maneuver burns was given to disposal of the SNAP, SNAP, radioisotope thermoelectric generator on the yeah. LM lunar module descent stage? Some history suggests it was deliberately targeted at the Marianas Trench. Perhaps a happy coincidence, question mark. And then I've got another short question after that. 
Yeah, they, they had a limited amount of uh, control authority over where the lunar module entered. And of course, not being uh, at all aerodynamic um, and, and, um, and all the uh, entry interface point was pretty much where it was going to break up. And uh, that uh, snap uh, container uh, package on the, the lunar modules, one of the lunar modules legs, I believe it was the uh, front leg, but I may be wrong there. Um, uh, that snap container was designed to survive uh, uh, a lunar return entry and, and sink intact. Um, so they went for the lowest spot they could find. And yes, that caused the uh, uh, command module recovery point to shift slightly, um, but they, they did make a best effort to dispose of that um, uh, responsibly. And mm -hmm. in this case, you know, you're talking being responsible uh, has to be uh, kind of weighted by the fact that human lives were at stake on board as, as well as potentially uh, in the sea. Um, although uh, in the Marianas Trench, that's a good place to put it, I would think. Uh, so that's that's how they got away with it. They didn't they didn't wind up bringing it close to Hawaii because the lunar module um, was not aerodynamic and and didn't have like a four thousand nautical mile uh, uh, atmospheric flight arc. Uh, pretty much ended at entry interface or slightly uh, later. So three more questions and uh, yes. and they're in the chat and I'll read them and. Uh... Attendance peaked at 96. Uh, that was the peak that I saw. Uh, uh, the first first of three questions, do you think SRP could have been contributing? It, it could have, uh, but then again, SRP contributed on every Apollo mission, right? Uh, what does SRP mean? That's solar radiation pressure. So it, it, it was certainly contributing. They did not model it that I'm aware of. Um, but they never modeled it in the, in the Apollo program. Apollo was, you know, a pretty compact spacecraft, even the entire stack with the lunar module attached, pretty compact because they had onboard fuel cells for power um, and uh, didn't have, you know, big solar arrays sticking out or anything like that. So today we may want to model and probably do model solar radiation pressure for Orion um, back uh, in the day, mainly because it was so compact, but probably also because of computer resources being stretched really thin. Uh, they didn't do a lot of uh, non-gravitational modeling in their trajectories, at least uh, in mission control. And what motors were used for the different post-abort burns? Uh, yes, I believe every one of them, including MCC2, uh, used the descent propulsion system. So the, the engine that was uh, designed to take uh, uh, the uh, lunar module down to the lunar surface and, and uh, uh, obtain a, a soft landing. Um, they even used it for the really small burn uh, for uh, MCC2 because they wanted to get confidence that they could use it for TEI, which was they knew would be a big burn. Uh, I'm trying to think now, MCC-4, I think MCC-4 may have used the lunar reaction control system. Um, but um, uh, if you uh, want to uh, answer with confidence to that question, uh, just email me. My email address is here if you don't have it. Um, that also reminds me, is that the last question, Douglas? There's one more there. Oh, OK. Uh, the the questioner says, if I recall, Apollo missions had a barbecue mode of thermal control where the CSM slash LM, I think that's command and service module slash lunar module stack was rotated at a slow rate to thermally equalize the spacecraft. Was this done on Apollo 13? And if not, would this have helped balance out the venting thrust to maintain the desired trajectory? It, it was done to a limited extent, but not under the tight control dead bands that they had for the axis of rotation being exactly perpendicular to the ecliptic plane, the plane of the plot in this case, um, uh, that they would in, in a normal mission where they had, they had the power to keep 
the GNC systems, the guidance navigation control systems alive uh, during, uh, during uh, passive thermal control. Uh, so they uh, pretty much just, you know, they might spin up a rate um, and then put the whole system to sleep. And um, there's one account of the crew calling down that they were just totally out of attitude for passive thermal control. Um, and uh, so, uh, but if they had been able to do passive thermal control, um, you probably still would have had some shallowing um, under the conditions of the service module post abort, uh, because you know you had the a whole side of the spacecraft uh, missing, a whole sector of the of the service module missing, with a bunch of ruptured and uh, leaking uh, tanks. Uh, sitting inside. And when, let's say you're in that nice thermal control mode um, and your axis of spin is nice and perp perpendicular to the ecliptic plane in which the sun is lying, uh, when you rotate away from the sun, you're going to wind up with pretty much cryogenic kind of temperatures in the service module. It has no thermal control. Um, and so uh, cryogenic temperatures and the boil rate is going to go down. The, the leak rate is going to go down tremendously. And then when you come around so that uh, uh, the hole and, and the leaking systems are facing the sun, then it's going to bake them real nice and crank up the, um, the vent rate and the vent force and the vent acceleration, always in the down sun direction. Not exactly, but biased toward the down sun direction um, as opposed to up sun. And so all your corrections are going to have to be up sun, you know, accelerating toward the sun, pointing your your uh, thrust axis toward the sun, more or less. And um, uh, so that is a good question. Um, thermal control was attempted, but not achieved successfully, I would say, over any period of time. Uh, and so you're left with this situation. You're, okay, now you're in a sort of random attitude. When are you going to see venting? Well, pretty much like you would have if you had thermal control with the, the service module damage like that, when uh, the damaged sections are being illuminated by the sun. Any other questions? Follow-ups, um, whatever? Somebody, somebody says thank you in the chat, so they got the question answered, good answer to the question. Okay, you're very welcome. Yeah, I had to puzzle this through myself. Um, let me, before I, uh, I close up shop uh, with everyone, uh, uh, say that uh, the source material for, uh, for this uh, presentation uh, is with uh, AAA Houston sections, uh, good uh, auspices, generous auspices, and, and Douglas's uh, uh, web men mentor, uh, web uh, uh, webmaster. Yeah, he is our, he is my webmaster to post all these papers, as you saw on the first chart, if I go up. And I'll put that in the chat, that webpage URL. Yeah, there, there it is here. Um, and uh, uh, these uh, uh, Astrodynamics Technical Interchange Group papers are all ar archived at this URL. So that's uh, uh, extending from 2008 onward after I retired. Uh, and we'll continue adding to them as long as I'm uh, lucid. And um, if you would like to subscribe to them, uh, so you get them as they come out, they come out at irregular intervals. I'm working on a huge one right now that um, started, worked 10 years ago and started writing in December. Um, they come out at irregular intervals, averaging about a month over time. Um, and uh, just write me um, at my email address and I'll, I'll be glad to add you to uh, distribution for, for ATIG. And that might be a stopping point, but we're not stopping yet. We're gonna, we're gonna follow Dan Adamo's lead as to when the event should really end. Um, with people coming and going, you know, uh, I'll make a list of the names that we see on the Zoom call. And uh, with people coming and going, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be over 100. Wow. Let's well, see. I, I, I've had says, my say. I've had my say. And 
I'm I'm ready to pack up shop unless there are more questions. I'm always. Oh, I, I've got a question. Room. I'm going to ask if you're tempted to tell the audience a little bit about your big upcoming paper, but you might just say no to that. Someone well, in the I, chat. I could. <laughs> Someone in the hard. <laughs> well, <laughs> we we advertised up until one p.m., but we um, we do not need to go that long necessarily. You you might even go longer. There is a something in the chat which says, I have a question on free return trajectories. Yeah, so Mike, so, if you'd like to just ask it verbally, that's fine too, instead of typing yeah, it out. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, yes, as I recall, they when they launched uh, Apollo 13, it was on a free return trajectory to start with, and then they changed that to be an off free return in order to optimize their uh, procedure for getting around the moon and and their landing site on the moon. Uh, but then after the CSM ex, uh, explosion, um, they went back to the free return trajectory in order to get back to the Earth. Um, and so if I recall, that was the right, uh, that was the sequence they, they used in, in regards to their free return trajectory, which means that if they left the spacecraft alone, it would automatically um, go around the moon and head back towards Earth, and there wouldn't be a, a loss of space, uh, a loss of crew anyway. And uh, so, if that's correct, do you do you know, uh, Dan, if uh, if they change that uh, um, that procedure after Apollo 13, so that they would always stay on the free return until they got to the moon? Uh, that's, that's a great question, Mike. I <laughs> um, uh, I think you are absolutely correct that. When translunar injection occurred uh, down here um, on the green arc, it was uh, maybe a, a, the next crew day after they went through their first sleep period, so they're probably out here somewhere, um, that they, they did the MCC-1 burn, which was what I call a deterministic burn. It wasn't a course correction. It was designed to change course, and <clears throat> it's probably on the order of uh, 15 or 20 meters per second, uh, delta V. And that's what put them off the free return trajectory. Uh, they did translunar injection targeted to the best of their ability to achieve free return, which in Apollo parlance meant you could just use an RCS system, one of the attitude control uh, jet systems to mid course your way into the proper uh, entry inter interface flight path angle uh, uh, range. So yeah. And then they got off, and then the first thing they had to do was get back on again. And, and it wasn't because of dispersions that they were off the free return. It was because uh, it was of intent. Um, at, in this particular launch scenario, getting to the Fra Mauro la uh, landing site uh, on the moon's near side meant that you needed uh, to have a lower um, uh, periapsis uh, in the lunar flyby then would have uh, resulted in an Earth-free return. And indeed, you saw where we wound up. And, and you can even see uh, in maybe a post-flight report, but one of the uh, surviving Apollo documents, you can actually see uh, the pre-launch what if uh, regarding, okay, you do this, um, what I call a hybrid course insertion, where you jump off the free return trajectory and go into this uh, lower, uh, uh, lunar flyby altitude. They had actually plotted it out uh, to the best of their ability. And I don't even know if they had the right launch date, but they, they basically um, saw um, this plot here, um, that you're going to miss the Earth coming back if you couldn't do anything uh, after a, uh, a translunar abort. And of course, yeah, that, 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 that was um, uh, good stuff. Uh, not really precise because as I say, it was done pre-launch. Um, then post-flight, um, I think what happened was on Apollo 14, they may have done something similar because they were going back to Fra Mauro. So the same landing site, <laughs> um, they may have done something similar, but for uh, the uh, uh, final missions of the program, they realized that they're capability to exert Delta V uh, as proven on Apollo 13 was great enough. So why not save some gas 
and, and eliminate that hybrid coarse insertion burn of 15, 20, 30 meters per second. Why not el eliminate it entirely and just target um, whatever you need for a lunar flyby for the nominal mission with translunar injection. So those last three missions, if anything, incurred a minuscule amount of, of additional risk by always being off the free return trajectory. But, you know, how far off is off? I mean, it, they, they really were within tens of meters per second delta V of, of getting back on again. Um, and it's kind of hard to try and second guess them, but I, I think what they're thinking is if you couldn't do that, if you couldn't get 20, 30 meters per second out of one propulsion system or another, you were in such bad shape that you probably lost the crew already. Uh, so a kind of calculated risk. Um, and uh, I don't really disagree with it. Um, what Artemis is doing might be even more aggressive. They're looking at translunar injection, targeting upper stage disposal. Um, by uh, uh, sending you, uh, instead of passing by the leading edge of the moon, and you can sort of see that's what's going on here in this plot. You're, you're passing by the leading side of the moon, uh, and that makes it um, pretty much impossible for you to get ejected from the Earth-Moon system. You're going to head back toward the Earth initially, at least, um, and, uh, and not get, if you do the other side of the moon and followed by the trailing uh, hemisphere of the moon uh, in your flyby. In other words, delay getting there so that the moon beats you to the flyby point, then it's going to eject you from the Earth-Moon system into solar orbit. And that's, of course, what we'd like to do in disposing of upper stages in the Artemis program. That's the responsible thing to do. And, and indeed, that's what they're probably going to have translunar injection do. That's certainly under consideration. Uh, and, and it's not a bad... Um, trade to make because the upper stages don't stay alive very long. They aren't, you know, able to be guided over periods of days while the trajectory gets just the way you want it with little course corrections. They're pretty much shutting down on day of launch. So you have translunar injection, basically send them uh, by the moon the right way so they don't come back for a long, long time. I mean, we're talking decades because it takes that long for the thing to get out into the solar system and then phase around Earth's orbit, either uh, uh, above it, uh, above the Earth's orbit or from below the Earth's orbit, phase around uh, over a period of decades and then get anywhere near the Earth moon system again. Um, oh, okay. And well, thank you, Dan. And, You're welcome. And thank the, you, Mike. Dan, I've got and a the, question. In the, question. in the chat, it says, it's great to see you, Dan. You look great. That's from Yusef Johnson. I'm sorry, go ahead. Thank you, Yusuf. Uh, just, just as you're talking about the free return, Dan, something I've always kind of wondered, and, and we've seen, you know, sling by other planetary bodies, and we know that the gravity on the moon is lumpy. How accurately above the lunar surface as you go around the backside to get that free return, how accurately do you need to target that? Because when you're at the moon, the Earth is an awful small target, and it seems like you could very easily miss the Earth or go straight down at the earth, which obviously would also be bad, but obviously it's much more missing the earth 360 degrees around the disc as you look at the earth. Yep. How accurately do you need to control your altitude over the lunar surface as you're doing that uh, swing by on the far side in order to, to really have a free return to the earth that, that does you some good? Well, the, the thing to keep in the back of your mind is that I have yet to see for human space flight a, a trans-Earth trajectory, the, the homeward leg uh, from the moon, that doesn't have at least three mid-course correction opportunities. Nobody thinks they're going to hit the, the target, especially a real tight flight path angle targeted entry uh, with uh, the ultimate precision. And so when you say free return, it's always with a grain of salt involved, some Kentucky windages in there about how precise your return is. And it's never never really precise. I've seen, I think, Apollo missions, and maybe Artemis 1 did uh, this as well. I can't remember exactly, but I've got a paper in the ATIG ar archives that'll tell you. Um, if they made the uh, trans-Earth trajectory with just one mid-course correction, but that's happened on occasion uh, in the Apollo program. Just one, that's all they needed. 
because uh, of well-behaved spacecraft and uh, well understood and, and all that, that, you know, you can predict it pretty accurately. One mid-course correction was enough to get you into that entry corridor uh, for a safe return. Uh, so do you know how, how many kilometers above the lunar surface, plus or minus, how much you have to, to control to really be hitting the Earth and aimed at the Earth? I would think within a few kilometers you need to be. Uh, okay, you so know, you, 10, 10 kilometers would be a pretty gross error. You could probably take it out with these mid-course corrections, but okay. um, the flight dynamics officer would be embarrassed, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> and, and um, well, sometimes, you know, those things get overcome by events. Uh, wow. And then you also mentioned the mass cons and the uh, uh, lumpiness of the lunar gravitational field. Um, you spend such a brief amount of time that close to the moon, even assuming you get that close, because the free return trajectory may have a periapsis height, you know, hundreds, maybe a thousand miles of, uh, or more, a thousand kilometers or more, that order uh, from the moon. And so unless, unless you're spending protracted periods, like, you know, a two hour orbit or more, uh, mm -hmm. only a hundred kilometers up, you don't really have to worry about the lumps and bumps that much. You're gonna have much more to worry about in your execution errors of the, of the maneuver, if there is a maneuver. Uh, but there always is one leading up to that flyby to, to make sure you've got the altitude right, at least. Uh, okay, so that's kind of the critical thing is that you're, as you're getting really close to the moon, you've got that altitude right, so that as you use the moon's gravity to swing you around, that you're coming back out where you want to be pointed at the earth. Okay. That's it. Yep. Okay. Well, I have one, one other comment, and that is, uh, uh, at that time of Apollo 13, I was working at North American Aviation uh, as a young employee uh, engineer, and uh, I was not working on the Apollo 13 exactly, but uh, we kept getting these announcements over the loud uh, speaker system about the status of Apollo 13, and when they uh, told us that it had to come into a, a shallow angle, uh, either between one one uh, you know angle and another angle and the, and the difference was only two degrees that uh, it was uh, apparent that we would either lose the astronauts to empty space or we will burn the astronauts up so uh, i and a number of other employees looked at each other and we kind of wrote off the three astronauts we said well we had the apollo 1 fire now we have apollo 13 we're going to lose three more astronauts because we couldn't see how with all the venting and the announcements coming over about the change of that angle because of some uh, mysterious eventing that is occurring and we don't know what's going on. We thought they're not never going to hit that two degree shallow <laughs> uh, boundary. And so we thought for sure that we would be losing astronauts. So uh, thank uh, uh, luck, uh, lucky stars, I guess, that they did hit it uh, okay and they were able to uh, to do the maneuvers that would uh, would get it in in pretty good stead, and uh, so thank you, Dan, for helping out on that uh, mission. That was good for you. <laughs> that was fifty years too late, but that's right. <laughs> uh, and it, you know that also bespeaks the power of um, the Apollo architecture. Um, granted, it, it was a failure that happened at the right time, but because of this lunar lifeboat option. Uh, the fact that you had a pretty much a independent spacecraft uh, with all you needed to come home to Earth except a heat shield uh, docked to uh, the uh, crew, um, you, you know, that made all the difference. It had uh, life support. It had uh, guidance, navigation, control, and propulsion. Um, you, you know, you pretty much were uh, set to come home, uh, albeit with some difficulties. <laughs> That's right. Thank you, Dan. Well, uh, very the welcome. event. Um... So, so, kind of of interest, Dan, as you're talking about swinging by the the moon, our speaker at Space Geek Speak, Tom, last week was talking about the European Juice, the Jupiter icy moon flyby coming up in August of 2024. He referred to it as a LEGA lunar Earth gravity assist. So it's using both bodies to get it on its path to Jupiter. Yeah, those can really tighten your launch window uh, and your launch period because the moon has to be of the right phase. Right. What he mentioned was that they had a number of, of launch windows and this was in one of them and it happened to launch in the window that has this Lega. So it wasn't that they were only limiting themselves for launching it. It's just 
happenstance that it it uh, has it. And he said it's the first time they're using both of these bodies. Excellent. Yeah. Well, that, now let's see. When do they launch? Uh, I don't know. They may have already launched. I lost have track. They already launched. August of 2024 is when this Lega Lunar Earth Gravity Assist uh, activity oh. occurs. Oh, okay. That could be uh, in a post-launch Earth Gravity Assist flyby kind of thing. But, mm -hmm. you know, at the very least, it'll uh, save them some propellant and add to their margin. So, yep. so much the better. I'll, I'll have to look that up. Yeah, yeah. Kind of interesting to use well, both. both. We, are, we are almost at the end of the event, but we have about eight minutes to go before one o'clock. And I... I want to thank everybody that made this event possible. Uh, we had uh, about 100 attendees on Zoom. And uh, and Dan, if you'd like to give people a preview of your big concept paper, your 10, pa 10 years in work paper, not giving away the farm comments, you're welcome to do that right now in our last few minutes. OK, uh, I'll stop sharing. And uh, uh, what I'm. Uh, I've been working on since I attended uh, one of these Keck Institute for Space Studies um, uh, workshops uh, about 10 years ago, uh, is the concept um, that you can see uh, in Carl Sagan's Pale Blue Dot, where he talks about maneuvering asteroids around in, uh, in orbit uh, so that they accomplish useful things like missing the Earth would be one. But I'm looking at a more... Uh, positive uh, function, which is uh, to function as a waypoint. Now, uh, I've done a really cursory preliminary uh, search for um, known asteroids that are in um, the right orbit period. Uh, and they, they don't really exist, certainly not in any profusion, but we're about to get a lot more asteroids in the catalog. But you're basically talking about an asteroid or maybe a, a habitat that you build radiation shielding around by grabbing small asteroids and lashing them around and, and building up radiation shielding that way. Um, but ideally, you'd have an asteroid with all kinds of resources on it that could be used for human habitation, used for uh, rocket propellant, uh, and it would function as a filling station in the sky. Um, uh, I think it's like about 20% farther from the sun than the earth is in a you know really circular orbit and and so it's it's different from the cyclers you've heard about that go between earth and mars um, that actually cross the planet's orbits and um, then require all kinds of jockeying between the times you use them which may be once every few decades um, jockeying to get them back into position so they do that again these asteroids would naturally be in the right location to function as waypoints. Uh, every, other, um, every other opportunity to go to Mars. So uh, Mars opportunities arise on average about once every 26 months. So you're talking once every 52 months, a little over four years, um, you would be able to reuse uh, the, these waypoints with no propellant whatsoever. They're just naturally there. Um, and then some really nice things happen. Um, I'm in the current, uh, currently wrapping up an investigation into uh, how they open up abort modes. Right now, when you leave from Mars from Earth and you're going you know, single leg straight out there, eight months later, you're gonna be at Mars. Uh, you're, um, uh, best abort mode is usually to just continue on to Mars. You can't turn around and come back to Earth. Um, in fact, you might have enough propellant to do that, but only in the first day or so after, um, after departing from Mars, doing trans-Mars injection. Uh, so, um, but the nice thing about these uh, waypoints is you've got a lot more... Um, uh, propulsive capability. If you take a starship uh, off of SpaceX's website, you take a starship and see uh, what you can do with a starship flying through one of these waypoints to Mars, uh, you can deliver more payload to the waypoint than you could to Mars. That's sort of intuitively obvious. Uh, and then if you can tank up at the waypoint 
like uh, a good filling station would let you, uh, you can then bring more payload to Mars than you would have in a single leg mission, straight to Mars, uh, because you're, you know, already pay you've already paid your gas bill for leaving Earth, and now you're going to replenish that. Uh, so there's all these powerful spinoffs, and it's, you know, the best analogy I can come up with is um, flying coast to coast from Portland is quite practical uh, with a 737, but almost no airline does it. Um, and, you know, they, they want you to stop in Denver and maybe a second airport before you get to the East Coast. And the reason for it is it, it, it makes economic sense. You can bring more payload uh, to Denver and more payload from Denver to uh, the East Coast than you could if you flew nonstop. So why not? It, it more than pays for the extra propellant you need to land in Denver and take off. So that's the concept I'm trying to develop. And like I say, cyclers have similarities, but um, they're, they, they pay tremendous propellant penalties and time penalties because you can't use them often if you don't use a lot of propellant. Uh, and so I'm uh, uh, hoping to take that forward to ATIG and uh, maybe uh, a few of these uh, uh, distinguished speaker engagements uh, like this Lunch and Learn. Yeah, we need that kind of creative, uh, let's think of something we haven't thought of before and, and try to implement that thinking. Yeah. yeah, if anyone's heard about uh, thinking along those lines, not a cycler, but a waypoint, um, be in touch because uh, I'll reference it in my paper, but I, I haven't been able to find anything quite like it. Cyclers have owned that concept um, probably far too long, in my opinion, but maybe someone can convince me otherwise. And I will read a few more things in the chat. We have one more minute, but we, we can go over time, but um, that's probably a good stopping point. One person said, I need to jump off. I look forward to watching the recording to hear more. Fantastic presentation and discussion. Thank you. Another one says, thanks. And then uh, Dr. Dexter Johnson says, TYI. Uh, that means more to you than me, I think. One person says, I don't know the exact answer on altitude sensitivity either, but we have seen for Artemis that small perturbations in lunar vicinity require corrections in the in the tens of m slash s milliseconds on return leg meter per second yeah. meter per second thank you and uh, we've, we we've also seen similar results if you try to target these return trajectories with only point mass gravity versus the higher fidelity gravity hmm. so tens of meter per second dv delta v is that the cost of maintaining that accurate entry corridor and three, two more comments after that. Yeah, you know, that, that's interesting. I, I have to wonder, and uh, please get on with audio if you're still with us. Um, what is the trajectory leading up to um, departing the moon? Is it just a flyby? Because flybys are quick. You know, they don't get down close enough to the moon for long enough for enough of those lumps and bumps to really uh, degrade your, your precision. But if you're in orbit, for 10 orbits or something like that, and you're trying to set up for trans-Earth injection, well, yeah, then, then you want a high, high precision model. And let's see, I don't know. And then a few more um, general comments. Fascinating stuff. Thanks everyone making it happen. I got a job off, looking forward to checking out future meetings. Another one says, gotta leave early. Thank you, Dan. And uh, I put in a CNN article about that TV show called The Space Race. Uh, and another comment says, thank you for this talk. Absolutely fascinating. I will certainly join your email distribution. And another thank you and got to jump off. We can chat about it sometime, Dan. And very nice discussion. Thank you, Dan. So I suppose that's a good ending point unless anybody has anything else. We really appreciate your time, Dan. This is oh no problem, and I, I appreciate uh, the platform and and all the interaction. Uh, I can't get enough out here. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Bye bye for now. All right.
Ouais. 